Hi, my name is Chen Huey, and um, I'm with EXO Group. Um, to give you a little bit of background, EXO Group is the not.com, which is the largest wedding website in America. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our Mesos journey uh, of where we went from uh, with Mesos. So, There's often this gap that you get when, between the time that you make the decision to uh, use a piece of software and uh, when you get to use it. So I'm from New York uh, and there we have these trains and unlike here they don't have the fancy doors, um, there is a gap. And so at this station what happens is this platform moves and fills in the gap. And so it's kind of what this presentation is about, is how you get, you fill that gap, moving from, uh, hey, I want to use Mesos, to getting it to production. Perfect. Uh, so the two gap items I'm talking about is you need a way to provision your infrastructure. In this case, we use AWS. And um, the other item on the right is software. Uh, it's the software being Mesos. Okay, I'll try not to hit the wrong button. Um, so with DCOS, um, or there's a couple ways to do it, right? So one way to run Mesos is to use DCOS. Uh, and so the couple ways to do that is they provide a cloud formation template, which I copied from their website, uh, what's on the right. Um, order is an advanced installer. The problem with the cloud formation is a couple of things. Uh, if you want to run it in production, you really need five masters, right? Because your quorum is three, so if you have a failure of one, you need at least five. And if you're really being um, going to have that level of redundancy, you're going to want five, not three. And they only have a, they only give you a formation template that lets you have three masters. So you have to go in and modify that um, at some point. Um, also, you know, it's for AWS, which the guy uh, before made a good point, you can't get to AWS. In fact, my demo is recorded um, because <laughs> all my instances I can't get to from here. Um, so the other way to do it is that they have an advanced installer which requires you to set up um, a bootstrap node and then bring up the machines. But the problem there is that 
it doesn't do you, it doesn't help with the first thing, which is provisioning infrastructure. There's nothing to do that. Um, so then we end up, the other way you can run it is to run what I call vanilla mesos, which is not DCOS, just mesos out of the packages um, that you can download. Um, so, you know, you can use, uh, we use Debian uh, based OS uh, at Xogre. So luckily they packaged those up and were able to use the package manager and install those. Um, or you, we, and we combine that with a little bit of homegrown orchestration. So there are some advantages to running DCOS um, that when we looked at it, was that it's fully packaged and integrated. Um, there is an AMI for it, so it's, it's this appliance like AMI, it's all built, you can just pull it down, it's in the marketplace. Um, and there's a command line interface, the um, DC, uh, DCLI. The downside is that the cloud formation, like I said before, is not very friendly, right? You have to go in and modify it. Um, if you want to run five, five masters, which I imagine you would, you have to go in and modify it. Um, it installs all the components, so every single node has all the um, Pieces, so it actually installs all the binaries for your master and slave, uh, regardless of whether or not it's a master or slave. Um, the advanced installer, like I said, doesn't cover how how you get your infrastructure provisioned, um, and it's the upgrades are it's unclear how you do it. Uh, with AMI, right? Do you have to, you know, destroy the instance and then replace them? Um, that's not entirely clear whether or not you can do them in place easily. So, in a way, using Mesos is like um, cloning, um, and mainly because you have this AMI that's the same, that's identical image um, that they're using to deploy, right? If the cloud formation, um, that's kind of how they're doing it. So the drawbacks of this approach is that um, meaning with cloud formation and AMI is that the last 10% of configuration is all done in Cloud formation user data, which is, if you're familiar with it, very difficult to debug. It's difficult to parameterize. It's a bit of a maintenance nightmare because you're mashing, um, you're, you're basically mashing a shell script in the JSON. Um, so it's, it's a very big mess. Um, the other thing is that small changes require you to remake the entire AMI. Um, so talk about how like why we're doing this. So we ended up um, <coughs> through evaluation deciding to use Ansible to configure the software. And mainly because it's pretty lightweight and um, kind of ideally suited to configure these things because with Mesos, the configuration is all mostly in file based. Like, it's a whole bunch of uh, configuration files that need to be set up. Like, if you remember from a couple of previous slides, it's just directory after directory of files. Um, so, Ansible is pretty good at doing that. Um, the other thing is that it's 
essentially a batch file and the order of operations is guaranteed from bottom to top, or sorry, top to bottom. Um, and you can declare separate tasks for each component. And so we were able to create a separate tasks for each of the pieces, uh, like one for common, one for Docker, Kronos, masters, and slaves. And that's how we're able to specifically only <coughs> install the pieces that are on each node. The other thing that comes out of the Terraform, which Ansible uses, is the inventory that Ansible uses, right? So um, there is an output function in Terraform, uh, and you can have it spit out all the uh, IP addresses for um, your masters and you do better, right? This is what user data is, and you see it's this big mess of bash that's like in JSON, and this is a relatively simple piece of it that I took out, right? If you're trying to do more complicated things, it gets much, much more unreadable. Um, this is what I was talking about when you can, we have separate uh, tasks for each um, component. So there's nicely separated, you know, for Kronos, Docker, Mesos DNS, Mesos Masters, Slave. Uh, we even have some uh, EXO specific stuff in first run. We're able to leverage the Mesosphere packages uh, like I said, we use Ubuntu, um, Debian-based, so we can install and upgrade <coughs> using the package manager, um, which I thought was interestingly something that was brought up in the previous presentation as being um, a pain point, and that is true. Like um, that's kind of one reason why we uh, ended up using Debian. Um, but uh, uh, this, I ended up recording the demo, um, so I'll run it from back here, and I'll kind of show you the Terraform first. So with Terraform, it's it's got this feature that allows you to um, put in an environment variable uh, with capital T F var and then the name of the variable. Um, so that's kind of how I set up. My access keys, which obviously I was going to record and throw up there for everyone to see. Um, but so you can see in one step, you can just bring up all your um, infrastructure. In this case, it's bringing up three masters and one slave. Um, and this was, yeah, there's a thing that I can't figure out why, um, you have to run it twice, which didn't used to happen, so, um, but it has something to do with one of the dependencies not matching. Uh, but if you run it twice, it comes up. <coughs> 
And so one, another good thing about Terraform that actually I didn't cover in the slides is that it also manages your state. So at the end of this, um, you know, it's kind of off the screen, but you can see, oh, perfect, uh, what comes out, right? Like the in um, this, you end up feeding into Ansible. Uh, and let me, I'll run the other one for your, um, oh yeah, I need to set uh, virtual in uh, for Python. So that's what's going on there. Um, so with Terraform, it manages the state. So if you end up modifying, let's say you want to go from five masters to seven masters, all you have to do is modify, and I'll, I'll show you when I get to go back. <laughs> um, a modify a parameter, change it to seven, reapply, do the Terraform apply, and it will bring up the additional master uh, and not change anything else and then update the state. Um, it's because it, it manages that state. You just have to keep those state files. It becomes something that you should check in um, and keep safe. But you can just see it runs through and the, the main takeaway from the demo besides, you know, it's just a lot of text is that it's literally two commands that you're executing and you can bring the whole thing up and well, unfortunately I can't <laughs> show you the, like what, um, where they are uh, from here but they're up at Amazon a fully functional um, cluster. In the course of, I think these recordings took like about 10 minutes total. Um, and only because of where I was, it was a, a little slow. Um, normally from our office, it's very fast. And, um, yeah, so let me go back to the slide. Uh, private Docker registry. So we use Amazon ECR, which is a private Docker registry. If you use Docker Hub private repos, you'd have the same issue um, in terms of having to distribute this Docker uh, authorization token. So you, there is this authorization token that needs to go onto all your slaves uh, where your containerizer is running um, in order for you to be able to log into these private Docker repos. Um, so you need to do this and so we ended up having to write some in, uh, some engineering work to do this. Um, and it ends up refreshing the token since it expires. I think it expires every 12 hours. We just have that time and refresh it every six, um, but you could do it every 12. So essentially, this is how it works. There's the blue is um, two Docker containers, um, and they're they're running and they're triggered by Kronos. Uh, so Kronos triggers it, and what it does is it, it's pretty simple. It just uses AWS CLI to log into ECR and then generate that auth token. Then it puts that auth token into the S3 bucket. So that's why we create that S3 bucket in that Terraform template if you um, kind of saw what was going on there. Um, from there, the other Docker container also runs after the one that generates the token, All right? So this one runs, pull the token from the bucket, and then pushes it out to the slave. And this does it every six hours. Uh, and all this is governed by Kronos. 
this is the config file, um, which configures how to do this. It indicates the uh, S3 bucket name, the role name. Uh, so instead of using keys, we use everything's role base. So the slave, um, slaves, no, yeah, the slaves have they all uh, assume that role. So then you don't need keys. Uh, that provides the permissions, and then it that then copies those files over to the slaves. The slaves are provided by that list from the metrics. Uh, oh, what's this? Oh, yeah, real simple. We're just using the AWS CLI to create the JSON. We don't really, really want to get into that business. It, it generates it nicely. Uh, here's some code where we're doing the role assumption. Uh, and then uh, downloading the files and kind of all of what that looks like. Um, so where does it leave us in terms of, so we went through, we configured all these things, we bring up Mesos, we're able to do it in two commands. Uh, and an interesting thing happened um, when we, <laughs> when I got accepted for this talk, we also simultaneously made the decision uh, at EXO not to use, end up using Mesos to, for our container cluster. Um, and mainly, I'll kind of talk a little bit about the reasons why. Um, some of it has to do with the marathon interface. Um, it's a little clunky, right? These are your two choices when you're um, deploying containers in using Marathon, right? Like it's either this UI or you're sending this giant amount of JSON, uh, which isn't the end of the world, but at the same time, our developers would now have to learn another interface, right? And it's kind of nothing really specifically against even Mesos because they would have to do the same thing with Kubernetes. Um, we're kind of interested because of what SwarmKit has offered um, in terms of having one interface for developers to keep using that they use this interface on their desktop. Um, and they would also use it to push um, their containers into production. Um, some of the things that we ended up not doing, but are were potentially had designed, was auto scaling the instances. Um, and you know, there's quite a bit of metrics that are available in order for you to like make decisions on whether or not to increase or decrease your number of instances. Uh, and we use IAM roles to facilitate that. Uh, again, like the slaves would have EC2 policies um, that will allow, allow them to create new instances. Uh, so in the end, um, we're not completely abandoning Mesos. Uh, we're ending up using DCOS uh, to run Elasticsearch. Our current Elasticsearch, uh, we're using the Amazon managed service, uh, which is a few versions old. So uh, this gives us a nice way to bootstrap Elasticsearch. Um, but for our containers, we're going to use Docker Swarm. Um, as that uh, we're doing that on a limited basis for our global proxies and home pages, and we'll be expanding that um, as we build some additional tooling for that. Um, why? <laughs> I guess there's, you know, we don't we don't like the fact that there's a proprietary CLI 
we also, as I mentioned, the awkward interface, or it's not, I guess awkward's a bad word. It's, it's really another interface that we'd like not to avoid having to um, support. Uh, Zookeeper's latency sensitivity, um, we find in our testing that it's very sensitive or even across availability zones and we um, would like to try to run our discovery, service discovery across regions, uh, which we're able to do uh, using console and Docker Swarm. And so yeah, um, that's ultimately where we're ending up with DCOS uh, to run Elasticsearch and Docker Swarm to run um, our containers. Uh, and I guess that's it. Thank you, uh, and uh, any questions? I guess not. Uh, have a great afternoon.